recipe and score. Ingredients and instrumentation. Cookbooks and masterworks. These items are comparatively different, but share a similarity in the way they are created. They also share similarities in the way they are enjoyed amongst company. Music and food share a history that isn't explicitly detailed. Rather, it is shown through context clues hidden in iconography, fables, and treatises. Wait, but, but how does music and food really relate? Like, really? Genevieve Thiel and Antoine Henian describe taste as a performative action in their article, Discovering Quality or Performing Taste. Taste as a performative action characterizes people into groups, especially those who share similar tastes. Genevieve and Henian explain that taste is a way of building relationships with things and with people. It is not simply a property of goods, nor is it a competence of people. More specifically, both authors identify three different relationships associated with taste. First, perception can be considered as a juxtaposition of two determinations, social and material. Second, taste can be analyzed as the result of the influence of external factors that act on the sensorial perception of a stimulus from a product or its interpretation. Finally, taste can be studied as the result of an oriented temporal process shaped by habits, experiences, and socially and culturally constrained or constructed learning." End quote. This description of taste mirrors a musician's experience. One's perception of music can be influenced by an external stimulus or a social aspect. It's like the scrunched faces we make when hearing a really good guitar line at a house show versus savoring those scrumptious stretches of cheese when enjoying a slice of pizza. There are also funny coincidences found in recipe and in score. They share similar properties, a list of items to be paired, separated, deconstructed, or to be used in a non-traditional way. Both are adapted over time to modern standards, and they both are meant to be practiced, annotated, celebrated, shelved, frustrated with, and memorized for a final presentation. George Kinaway expressed a similar sentiment in his article, Bookcases, Fish Pie, and My Pinata, Musical Scores Considered as Sets of Instructions. He writes that recipes and musical scores show different levels of specification and that annotated performing editions are essentially transitional texts to be discarded of once the performer has evolved their own concept of the work. Because of this similarity in practice and performance, historians and musicologists are able to compare the dates of these recipes and scores and maybe compare the specification of both. Do more complex meals happen to share the same location and time period as their musical counterparts? Is there a dish specific or popular to a place where there is also a precedent method of counterpoint or theory? Kenaway's research encourages musicologists, historians, and theorists to search in unfamiliar places for this relationship between music and food. Gioia Filicamo's article, Hungry Women, also speaks about the beginning of music and food's relationship by writing, quote, Taste and smell, sight, hearing, and touch. Preparing elaborate food and polyphonic music requires active connections across all five senses. Creative cross-references where both mouth, connected to food or singing, and hands, to prepare food or write down and perform music, are essential, end quote. The music of tonight's recital addresses these creative cross-references with music written for acoustic performance that is then combined with the sounds we make while cooking, thus presenting the intersection of music and food.
So earlier we were discussing Genevieve Thiel and Antoine Henian's description of how we form musical taste. They explained that first perception can be considered as a juxtaposition of two determinations, social and material. So like how else can we say that? Maybe it's your taste in life is determined by social and material things. Sure. Another way, we are more than the sum of our parts. We are informed by more than what we say, do, or think, or cook, or sing, or play. The development of musical taste comes from the result of the influence of external factors, which are individual and specific to every listener. An audience, musician, or composer's listening experiences are shaped by their own habits and learning that have evolved over the span of their lifetime. Despite the distinction of individual human experiences, there are hierarchical views and distinctions made to separate, quote, amateur tasters, unquote, into specific groups. Thiel and Hennian presented a case study on a music lover and an amateur wine enthusiast named Raoul as an example. When choosing wine, Raoul first tries those which are best in order to guide his perception and to be sure to avoid mistakes in his perception of the quality of the wine he buys. He is also attentive to what experts say. He listens to connoisseur friends' opinions, buys many books that inform his decision-making. However, when Raoul chooses his music, he never relies on others' advice. He considers it inapplicable to his case. When comparing this case study to the three parameters for evaluating taste that Thiel and Henian presented earlier, we can determine that perception really is because of our social and physical material. For example, Raoul's choice of books and sources versus his social engagement. Therefore, the audiences present for both meals and music bring a perception that is influenced by different stimuli and learned behaviors.
Now, let's address the last two parts of Teal and Henian's statements. They explained earlier that, quote, taste can be analyzed as the result of the influence of external factors that act on the sensorial perception of a stimulus from a product or its interpretation. Taste can be studied as the result of an oriented temporal process shaped by habits, experiences, and socially and culturally constrained or constructed learning. End quote. Musicians and composers are not only defined by their musicianship and art. They have interactions with other people that are not musicians, like humans. Has this intersection of music and food happened earlier than we think? Could it be possible that the defining figure of this intersection was Hildegard von Bingen? Hildegard was a composer, mystic, cook, teacher, and seemingly all-knowing figure in the 12th century. In her treatise, Physica, Hildegard provides a list of medicinal herbs and spices that are incorporated into recipes that she claims to heal the body. She is also a dignified composer who was well known throughout Europe. There seems to be a historical gap in the relationship between food and music that either wasn't documented or was discouraged from public knowledge. However, this parallel instance of music and food should encourage us to consider other sources outside of music and cross-reference them in order to make a justified inference about this relationship of music and food. So, let's do that, but in a Reader's Digest version. Cross-referencing sources illuminates the parallel lives of important historical figures. Claire C. Olson supports this idea by identifying both Guillaume Machaut's musical presence and Geoffrey Chaucer's literary presence in her article, Chaucer and the Music of the 14th Century. Olson distinguishes Chaucer's writings as source material for a study of music in the 14th century that has long been recognized, while also commenting on the lack of knowledge pertaining to Chaucer's involvement with music. She writes, quote, Charles Burney and John Hawkins quoted and discussed passages from Chaucer's works, and scholars today have done the same. None of these, however, employ all of his knowledge and interest in music, nor of the total effect which that knowledge and interest had upon his poetry. In order to do this, one should not only make a complete analysis of Chaucer's references to music, but should also discover the aspects of the music of his day, which he does not mention. End quote. Machaut was also known to be a brilliant poet in the 14th century, and Chaucer used Machaut's work extensively. Jacqueline de Weaver claims in her entry made in the Chaucer Name Dictionary from Columbia University that Chaucer, quote, could not have escaped Machaut's influence. Chaucer says he translated the Book of the Lion, a reference most likely to Machaut's De Tu Lion, end quote. Chaucer also wrote the Canterbury Tales in 1392. It was at this time in history that Philip de Vitry introduced Ars Nova as the new compositional style. Guillaume Machaut distinguished himself as a composer at the time, especially with his work Messe de Notre Dame. According to Olson, Machaut compiled a list of 31 instruments in which he named the Cure of Fortune, an ensemble that played, get this, only after dinner. Though it be a minor detail, this could be the first obvious instance of a composer who is cognizant of music and food sharing an audience. Music and dance mostly occur in social settings, usually in front of nobility whom are accompanied with food in Chaucer's tales. By identifying Chaucer's use of music and setting in his stories, as well as noting Machaut's specific use of music after a meal, one could infer that music was included in social scenes that people indulged in during the Middle Ages. This detail also brings our music community closer to finding this intersection. 